Hi everyone, it's the tiniest one back with another video for you and today it's the lower priced, less expensive, maybe a better term, in my very best Jeremy Clarkson-esque voice, um, the Aorus Master rather than the Extreme. And when I say less expensive, because this board still comes in around the 520 to 540 pound mark but then that is a lot less expensive than 750 to 800 pound mark that the master can be coming in at now obviously with the um price going down that means there has to be cuts but where will they be <laughs> So where will the cuts be? And the first place, in reality, is inside the box, especially compared to the Extreme, because the Extreme had the extra add-in cards and all kinds of extra bits and bobs in the box. But, uh, and by the add-in card, I mean the uh, PCI Express 4 add-in card, RAID card thing. With the, it looked like a mini graphics card. It actually looked a bit like an 8800 GT. So it didn't, uh, doesn't come with this. This holds um, up to four... PCI Express 4 NVMe drives. Like I said, it looks a bit like an old 8800 GT, if you can remember that far back. That's even got a backplate on it. So it doesn't come with this. It doesn't come with fancy Wi-Fi antennas and stuff as well. Well, not as fancy anyway, because there is a single one. I think the other one had two. Then you do get some uh, SATA cables, and they are normal SATA cables as well. They aren't the fancy fabric ones. You get a couple of thermal probes. Then you get um, RGB extenders. You get some Velcro cable ties. And then this is actually a little microphone, which is something you can use uh, with the fan software. And essentially what you can do is set your fans up by noise level rather than RPM. So that's all kind of cool. And then you get some uh, stickers, which they put in everything. So one place that hasn't been cut is the VRM area because it comes with exactly the same uh, spec and layout of VRMs and MOSFETs with the Infineon controller and the Infineon uh, MOSFETs as the extreme. With 16 plus 3 channel, but the actual main 16 side of it feeding the CPU is exactly the same. And the uh, heatsink uh, looks very, very similar as well. The only thing that I would say is you do get the um, heat pipe down the side, which is the same like super large eight millimeter heat pipe. But then because there's less IO down the back, you can see behind this main heat sink that you do get another heat sink there. And what I did want to do is straight away bring up the uh, VRM graph because it's one of those ones where it's strangely, the, and on paper that VRM cooler especially, and the fact that the Master, the Extreme, and the uh, Creator all use the same VRM and the same controller. The only one that's different is the uh, Zenith, and their wired is teamed, so no doublers, but it's only an eight channel controller going into, uh, then doubled up into 16 actual MOSFETs. And so they're all running pretty much the actual same MOSFET. So uh, the difference between the boards you'd think would be cooling, but I actually think it's something down to, with the Gigabytes specifically, because that the cooler does look like it should be so much better on paper, I'm actually starting to wonder if it might be something to do with switching, because the faster they switch, the warmer they will be. So it does make me wonder whether that is something that they might be able to tune out a bit with later BIOS, or whether there's some other reason for it. Uh, because like I said, when they are so similar, when you do get one board that is, you know, seven, eight degrees warmer than the other one, and we do our testing all in a controlled room as well, set at 20 degrees, and they're all tested in the same case with the same fan RPMs. So it is a bit of a strange one, and it does make me question things that little bit more. But anyway, this actually, let's get naughty. So I've started to strip things down just to give you a bit of a naughty view. So with um, some of the screws taken off the back and actually the back plate as well, which I'll show you in a moment, you can take the plastic shroud off. As you can see, there is a small fan 
underneath there. Now, what that fan is actually loosely, therefore, it's just underneath this. You can see this uh, large actual heat sink array. Now, that is for the Aquantia 5G Ethernet chipset. And uh, around the back, I'm hoping the camera is going to be able to pick up because it is up here and it roughly forms in around this point on the board and you can just you can see a slight discoloration there the reason for that discoloration is they have even added a thermal pad around the back of the board to help wick away heat from the uh, back of the PCB as well so that little indentation is there and then there's a thermal pad and that is right on the back of that um, Ethernet chipset there. So you can obviously tell that that's going to get a bit warm. And then if it gets too warm, because you've been absolutely hammering it, I'm assuming the fan kicks in. But I don't know whether that's going to be any good for the actual VRMs itself. I certainly can't see them getting hot enough where that fan will make that much difference. And that fan pretty much touches that um, Ethernet heatsink anyway. But if I was to keep removing screws. So one thing I do want to make very aware at this point is just to be clear with you guys. I've done all of my testing, gathered all of my results and done all of my thermal testing before removing these heat sinks. So in case anyone thinks or in case Gigabyte think I took this off, disturbed things, didn't put them back properly. I've completed my testing. My re written review is written and the click link underneath to go to the website is all there. And I'm just stripping this now for the video to show you guys at home. Now, as you can see, I've removed all of the screws and there were a lot more of them than I was prepared for. And it goes right the way down over the, um, and gives active cooling for the um, audio side of things as well. There's not many boards where you see massive heat sinks for the audio. But there is the main event at the top and I will zoom you in as much as my camera lets me. If I back off a little bit, there you go. You can see the Infineon controller here and then across the top you can see each one of the actual MOSFETs. If I zoom you in any further on this they will go blurry. So I'm doing my absolute best. So you can see the 16, then the gap, then three, because it is 16 plus three. Then if we were to come back this way and come down a little bit, we can find that Aquantia chip. There we go. That is for your five gigabit ethernet. You can even see the little writing for it there. And we come down here and eventually, once we get past the I.O., so that's the top of the bottom of the I.O., sorry. And when we come down further, we come down into the ESS DAC. A little bit further down to the Weimar capacitors. Oh, there's the ESS DAC. Camera's brilliant when it zooms in this much. Anyway, so I'm going to go slowly back up just so that you can have a look if you are interested. So it's a very up close and personal look, everything, so that you can zoom right in. Don't forget you can pause at any time as well. Then when we hit the I.O., come up the back. Now these are called as well, I believe these are... Um, as a part of the feed for the memory, but I'm not entirely sure because the, 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 the documentation is a bit lacking about that down the side. But anyway, further up. Back to that 5GB Aquantia chip. It does actually say MOSFET fan there, doesn't it? think the other one up here, yeah, you go, LED cover, MOSFET fan, but it is pretty much, just so that you're all, to show you, I'll zoom out, that fan sits here, and then 
that 5 GB chip literally is directly underneath it. So I think it's more there for that rather than cooling any kind of MOSFETs, but it's in that kind of area, so we get it. And then as I said, coming back across. Could almost do a David Attenborough voice with this. But anyway, so there we go with, I'm not gonna pull all of the heat sinks off. I wanted to give you a good look of the, the stuff down the side. And also to kind of explain why I was a little bit confused with why the the actual VRM temps were that little bit warmer. I don't know, maybe we need to try changing the uh, thermal pad or something. I don't really know. Because to look at it, there and on paper, you'd think it'd be cooler. Every single one of those pins is solid. Now with the other manufacturers, sometimes you get two of the 12 pins are solid and then the others are all the normal folded ones. But with this, Every single one of those pins is solid. So all in the eight pin, all in the 24 pin, all solid pins, and they are all shielded as well. Something else that's a bit weird that they started doing, they did it on the extreme as well. This is actually where your front panel header um, cables go. So your power switch, your reset switch, the hard drive activity light, the um, uh, uh, main power light, they all get plugged into there. Now, I suppose you could say that, you know, you can then hide them in with the 24 pin, but lots of us now are going full ball with, you know, nice braided cables and um, cable combs and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's something different from the norm. I don't dislike it. I think it's just gonna take a little bit of adjustment. You see the USB 3.2, 3.1 Gen 2 here. It's the, um, uh, for your case. And then you've got eight SATAs down the side. Nicely nice. I'm just going to bring the board up so that I can balance it. And then what I can do is I can give you a much better look down here as well. So you've then, you see where the noise sensor goes. Um, you've got a fan header and a pump header, depending on which one you want to use it for. And then you've got a couple of USB 3s, two USB 2s as well. And then you get a row of three more fan headers, so lots of onboard fan headers. Some of the other boards have actually been a bit lacking in that department, if I'm honest. Moving across, you get another couple of RGBs. LED demo switch. I've got a magic cable for that, but anyway. And then your front panel audio, and then we're back up to the areas that we've already seen, but we now have the heat sinks back on. Now, you can't see a fan header there. You normally come up from the... If you had a rear case fan, sometimes you'd then wire it in here. But I've already showed you this one up here. So I actually prefer it being up here because it makes it tidier. Um, and you can pretty much hide it around this rather than having it flapping around in a really visible bit right across the top of your graphics card. You've obviously got the chipset fan over here. It's a large five centimeter fan. Um, didn't hear it getting loud at all. You've got a couple of uh, M.2s over here which are all kind of a part of the design of this. So it's meant to help cool it. You can see that you've got shielding around the PCI Express here, and there are four of them as well. I will bring up the magical um, lane layout kind of block diagram so you can get an idea on how they've done it. But you also then get the um, bracing and the shielding for the dim slots as well. All in all, I actually think aesthetically it's quite a nice board and it's not that much of a cut down from the extreme. Admittingly, it doesn't have the 10 GBE Aquantia, it's only five, but you get a normal one gigabit, then you get the five gigabit, and then pretty much the bulk of everything else, pretty, you still get Wi-Fi 6, Now don't forget, when you do come to getting uh, these and people might be thinking to themselves, oh, we've not got enough USBs. I even personally run a USB hub on my desk and I have it uh, on the corner behind the monitor underneath the desk. And then my keyboard, my mouse and the audio all go into that hub, including my phone charger as well now, I'll come to think about it. 
but it means I have one cable that then goes off to my PC and plugs in. And it also makes keeping things around the desk that little bit tidier as well. So you haven't got to worry about long keyboard cables or long mouse cables and everything like that. So maybe give that a try. Okay, so on to performance. And one thing I will say straight away is you can click through to the OC3D website. You can go and look at more of the graphs over there, much more testing, more written information on the board itself. But for what I'm gonna start with is gaming. And weirdly, I know that you're going to kind of say, well, it's a Threadripper board, but you know we don't particularly care about gaming. It's just for content creation. And I would agree with you. But the fact that the Threadripper chips now do naturally boost themselves much higher and that they have just become the clock speed difference has now made them a better gaming CPU. Now, I wouldn't suggest that you bought one of these to build as a gaming system, but if it was something that you were going to have and have it as a bit of a grey area where you can do your um, 3D rendering or your photo editing or whatever that you end up, you know, the, the core work for it was, but then at lunchtime maybe you flick it over or in the evenings when you then go on and you like you want to go and have your raid or play your car game or whatever like that, these aren't now as bad as an option as they were with the first generation. They've come a long way and like I said, the um, core optimizations within Windows so that it actually uses the strongest core more and the fact that the overall clock speeds are considerably higher, they make a better option and the gigabyte and has excelled at this. Also with Sony Vegas, the weird side of things with Sony Vegas is that um, it does like clock speed. So the stocks tend to do quite well, but the, the results seem to be quite close together because you're gonna have one core at 4.8, and then when we do our manual overclocks with these, it was uh, 4.3 across all of the cores at 1.35 volts and it keeps all the temperatures down. Sometimes it can actually mean that they use less power when we overclock them because you're not getting as much of a voltage boost and the, the, you know that one core gobbling up all the juice. But normally with the uh, multi-core stuff, the overclock will do better. It's the lower threaded or clock speed dependent stuff that prefers the stock and that's why the, the Vegas stuff ends up balancing out. But then we go into Blender, Blender obviously more cores. It's going to prefer the fact that the clock speed on all the cores has gone up from 3.8 to 4.3 and that's reflected in the graphs. And the, uh, the stock wasn't so great with this one, but then when you put the overclock in place, it takes it right up there to relatively near the top of the graph. Now, one thing I would say is the Aorus Extreme is obviously a great bore, but the fact that it's so much more expensive ends up weirdly turning this into a little bit of a Goldilocks product where it makes this one seem like a little bit more sense. Because you get the VRMs, they're not as cool as I'd probably expect. Neither of them were, if I'm in, uh, set, you know, really honest. But they're not hot. And that's something I do need to stress and shout from the rooftops. Is they are not hot. A little bit warmer than the competition. And the fact that now they're all using the same MOSFETs, you know, the same Infineon stuff. It's only the controllers that are really different. It does kind of actually make it a little bit more of a level playing field. So with these not hot but i'm not being funny for a 3950x for it only to be up around the 60 degrees mark is astounding so you don't particularly need to worry about that um the 5gbe on the ethernet down from 10 fair enough but to be fair it really depends on what your home network or your work network is going to be capable of are you 10 gbe ready do you need to be spending another two to three hundred pounds to be able to up that could you save your money and put up with the five could you find yourself a cheap hundred pound 10 gb add-in card might not be that great but you get the kind of points that i'm starting to go with with this the actual um hard drive add-in card that might end up being the, the the thing that if you actually want it and need it and you're going to fill that full of pcr express four drives and raid it up and have something insanely fast that might be your need for doing it. But if you're just going to have a single PCR Express 4 and chuck a 3960X in there, get yourself a decent um, cooler, cooler mask that actually do a proper thread ripper, 360 millimeter. I think it's called the TR4 cooler. I can't remember the part number off the top of my head, but it's the one that we use. Um, 
Uh, if you plonk that on it, you could have a, a wicked rig, and then it's really going to depend on the sort of state of graphics card that you have in there. Is it going to be a um, specific render monkey kind of NVIDIA one? Are you going to go RTX, or are you going to go, you know, the specific Pro one? Only time's going to tell, but I actually think this becomes quite a good prospect. It is just, I know everyone's going to say about price. We kind of need to put that to bed overall now, because uh, it's not necessarily the board manufacturer's fault. It's just everything else that they have to do to these boards. It's much more in depth than it would have been for, for argument's sake, a Z390 board or even an X470 board. So don't give them too much grief for that. Anyway, cracking board. Like I said, the Extreme makes it seem like a much better board, much better value overall as well. And I think this would be the one for the majority of you guys is going to be the one that you're going to end up picking. And that's not necessarily a bad thing either.